This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking. Join the conversation every Tuesday at 11 as we dissect issues that are important to you and your family. That's Relatively Speaking, Tuesdays only on MPB Think Radio. From MPB Think Radio, it is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. I'm Abram Nanny, in for Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of Mississippi Museum of Natural Sciences, out this week. Today is an all-pet day here on Creature Comforts, so we've propped the doors to the pet hospital wide open. We welcome all your pet questions from the big to the small, so do you have a cat or a dog at home? Do you have both? Maybe you have questions about getting an exotic pet like a rabbit, snake, or ferret. Don't hesitate to join the conversation. Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. And as a reminder, if you happen to miss Creature Comforts on Thursday, it now repeats on Saturday mornings at 6. Now, like I said, we've got Dr. Major here with us. Good morning, Dr. Major. How are things at the clinic? It's a typical uh, morning. Everything's busy right now, but we're doing good, Okay. Good deal, good deal. How are you yourself? I feel like we don't ask that enough. Doing fine. A uh, little, uh, what shall I say, allergies going on, uh, like everybody else or most everybody else. Right. And they affect the dogs as well, dogs and cats. But uh, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Yeah, good deal, good deal. I mean, I've, I, I definitely feel you on that. I've, I've been having some allergy problems myself. Uh, just as a reminder, we, this is an all pet day. Uh, now, Dr. Major, a lot has been said in the past about certain breeds of animals being more difficult than others. Than others. Uh, is that something that you found in your work, like certain breeds of dogs are more difficult? That's absolutely true. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the owner, to be honest with you. Right. I've seen excellent tests for just about every breed. On the other hand, there's some that are uh, could be dangerous if not trained properly uh, and have the care. One of the things that we see, and of course, think about this, a lot of our animals that really, really are good pets, they need more to do than what they have. In other words, let's take, for example, a border collie. Uh, Genetically, they're uh, inherently uh, used to uh, corral and uh, control herds of sheep or uh, cattle. And if they sit around the house all day long, they get pretty bored. And, mm-hmm. uh, they need the time to get out and exercise and run. Uh, and there are a lot of examples of that, of different breeds. Some breeds are much more, what shall I say, sedentary, uh, but all need exercise. Right, yeah, they all, they all need something to do. They can't just sit around the house and get fat all day like some of us would like to do. Well, well a lot of, you know, a lot of homes... Uh, there's nobody there during the day except for the pets, and they're left to their own devices. Sometimes they get in trouble. Right. Either separation anxiety, tearing up furniture, or uh, just generally uh, maybe wrecking havoc in the house. But our, our cats are a whole lot more adept to house living, and uh, they entertain themselves to a certain extent, but they too need environment or rich with uh, things to do, uh, whether it's a box to play in, uh, a tree, or any type of things that they can uh, extend their energy, and uh, it really helps. Right, yeah, and I, I've seen uh, an example of uh, from internet you know, cat owners and stuff that orange cats are, are typically more disobedient than others. Is that something that you've seen yourself? That's a great question. Uh, some orange cats owners would disagree with that. However, <laughs> I do know one or two orange cats have really gotten in trouble um, because they're they're smart. Many of them, I uh, don't know if this is universal with orange cats, but a lot of them learn to open doors, uh, <laughs> uh, and maybe turn the water on. Uh, but uh, they all, uh, I won't say it's definitely just orange cats, but some people think that as well. Right. I love I love seeing videos on the internet of, you know, any cat really. Uh, but the, the owner sitting there telling the, the cat not to knock a glass off the counter or something and it's just looking them in the eye and it swats it off the counter regardless. Right. Right. And they like to 
maybe have some degree of control, uh, and they're mischievous in a lot of a lot of instances. I have one cat though that can get on uh, a crowded counter, be able to walk across the counter uh, without knocking off anything. So some are very adept, and others are I think they're mischievous and they want to create some habit. Right, and it uh, it uh, they obviously have their own personalities, but it also a lot a lot depends on the owner. Absolutely. And um, there are things that you need to discuss with your veterinarian if you have a dog that's, uh, let's say, has separation anxiety. Uh, some dogs really can't even tolerate being kept uh, in a crate during the day. Uh, I've seen some that literally would tear their way out, even on the hard side of the crate. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we, had a, uh, we had a steel wire crate that we were keeping my uh, Mastiff and... Oh, what else is she? I forgot. I, my wife is going to be so upset that I completely forgot what breed she is, but she kept breaking out of the the crate with no problem. Um, right. Uh, as a reminder, this is a pet day, so we have a caller on the line. Kathleen in Osaka has just a story that she wants to share, share with us. What's, what's, what's your story, Kathleen? Well, I blame Dr. Troy for bringing up cat destruction. <laughs> I, was out of town. I was out of town for two and a half days, had the cats loaded up with food, litter boxes and water and stuff all over the house. I came home, and uh, I used to be uh, deal a lot with antiques. I had two uh, early 1900s, late 1800s ladder back chairs that were original cane seating. They had destroyed all two of the seats and were batting it around like a hockey game <laughs> in my kitchen when I walked in. I said, welcome home, Kathleen. Here we go. <laughs> but I actually had a pig named Sarah Jane, a gift from my grandson, God bless him. Uh, she learned not only how to open her gate, and this is a true story, she would walk across well, my property is 600 feet deep across the highway to the kids next door when they got home from daycare about 10 o'clock. And then she'd play with them. Then she'd cross that street, the same side of the street, and go down another two houses and play with some kids that were 10, 12 years old. They sent her back one day with a railroad scarf around her neck, sunglasses and a hat, <laughs> and she walked home like that, and they followed her just to make sure she made it back. I never laughed so hard in my life. And she just let Sometimes it happen. Was, she let it happen. Oh, she was friendly. Her best friend was my goat, Hungry Jack, and they used to walk around the property together. Uh, just funny stories with animals. You know, you just, if you have pets, you learn to laugh, but now I'm looking for someone that can do cane feeding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's this is... replaceable. The chairs, the chairs are not, and they didn't really damage those. They just had fun with somebody put those grass things there for them to play with. Yeah. Yeah. This was a pig that you said was running around opening doors and stuff? Oh, she knew where the food was in the cabinet, and she'd go over to it, <laughs> whoop it. Open it up, pull the bag out with what she wants, and let go she left it on the floor. But uh, she loved to come in and watch TV. I mean, she was a mess, that Sarah Jane. You know, she really was. That's very fun. I've actually, I read that uh, pigs are considered to be like the third or fourth smartest animals on the on the planet, like right behind us and, and monkeys. She understood so yeah. many words like brush, fall, uh go to the vet. She did not want to go to the vet. Oh, you'd think I was killing her back here to get her in the van and take her to the vet. <laughs> now she got there, she was fine. But I had to call ahead and make sure they knew Sarah Jane was coming in, you know? Right. Go, it's Sarah Jane. It's Sarah Jane. Oh, Lord. And she loved every minute of it, let me tell you. <laughs> well, I appreciate you calling in, Kathleen. That's always fun to hear about these unique pets. Okay, you have a good day now. Thank you. You too. Now, Dr. Major, if you had much experience dealing with, with a pig, of all things, in, in the host, vet hospital? We do see some occasionally, and uh, actually, uh, if properly cared for, they make, they make good pets. Now, uh, we went through a stage a decade or two ago with uh, the pot-bellied, miniature pot-bellied pigs. 
And one of the problems, they were sold a lot of times with the idea that they were going to be maybe 30, 30, 35 pounds. And some of these developed um, into quite large animals, maybe 100 pounds or more. So Mm -hmm. you have to consider that. And, uh, uh, you know, just a domestic pig, let's say a a pig that you would see at a uh, farm, a lot of those uh, pigs will become... uh, 150, 200 pounds, and oh can be goodness. pretty heavy. And um, they are smart, though, and can be trained, uh, which is pretty amazing. That's wild. I, I love that they uh, they can be trained so adeptly. But also, if you're considering getting a pet like that or something that you, that is you know unique, uh, definitely do the research on that. That's absolutely right. And any pet, regardless especially if you're a first-time uh, pet owner, you need to research, actually research the breed uh, so that you'll know. Obviously, you may uh, adopt a mixed breed animal, this sort of thing, which is fine, but always prepare ahead of time and understand that every animal, just like people, are different. So you have to use some uh, common sense a lot of times in training. Uh, one of the things about a pig, if it's in the clinic and it decides to squeal, it can deafen everybody. They have quite a quite a voice when they're upset. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine just like uh, most other intelligent animals, they can protest whenever they feel like it. When we return, we'll be looking for your pet questions for Dr. Major. Uh, and also, if you are just like Kathleen and want to share some stories, that's all right as well. We love to hear your, your pet stories or wildlife stories, whatever comes in. We have Mikey and Mobile ready when we come back. And you can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. I'm Abram Nanny in for Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major. And today... We are taking your pet questions and talking about any other any other brushes with nature's, and uh, also we've kind of just gotten the the vibe of getting just some pet stories. So if you want to join the conversation with a question or comment, send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Uh, Doctor Major, I believe Mikey in Mobile is on the line with us. Uh, Mikey, what you got? I got a couple of things. Now they're separate stories. I'll try to be briefer because it's actually a recommendation for a piece of literature that will be excellent with your kids, no matter whether they're in the same generation as me and Kathleen or whether they're. It's written aimed towards middle schoolers, and it's written by the late great international hero Jimmy Buffett from Mobile. Okay. And the and the title is Swine Not. <laughs> S-W-I-N-E-N-O-T by Jimmy Buffett. Now, okay. who, knew that that guy, who knew that that guy wrote kids' stories? Now, Kathleen's going to go crazy for this one because it's about um, a family that moves into New York City with their pet pig, and uh, it, it's just quite, I mean, believe me, no matter what age you are, you will laugh out loud. I, I think I've read that story back when I was a kid. I, that sounds familiar. The story does. I'm not, not the title, but the story itself sounds familiar to me. Yeah, Swine Knot. That's, That's funny. Yeah, Swine Knot by Jimmy Buffett. Okay, now my question, Dr. Major, you get the hard part. Um, <laughs> doggy, uh, doggy introductions. But I know, hey, he's so up for it. I mean, he is the expert. That's why we call oh, him. Oh, he's got it. Um, um, uh, uh, well, it's Like I said, Kathleen will certainly – oh, but I do have to point out that I know that Kathleen also has mentioned that she's had a lot of problems with um, wild pigs on her property. And uh, um, neither – yeah, I can can certainly sympathize with her, but that's a whole different sort of a thing from this story Mm -hmm. about pot-bellied pigs. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I would have to introduce that as a caution also. Absolutely. Do you have a question for Dr. Major? Yes, sir. I sure do. All right. And I'm going to, I'll try to be succinct. Um, uh, <laughs> very difficult for me. Um, but, uh, doggy introductions. I have two dogs, small dogs, um, 30 pounds of half chihuahuas, I, I usually say. And one, uh, but there's another. Um, there was a passing in my family, and uh, a, an even smaller than my smallest, um, and he's 
about eight pounds. The other dog is probably maybe seven pounds. Uh, and but also, actually, he's half sister. His half sister is my oldest dog. Um, they're all getting up in age, Doctor Major, and uh, <laughs> like the rest of us. And uh, my, my my sister's passing left us with this little bitty guy, and he's been staying with my brother because he and my little dog, my male, don't get al- did not get along when they were younger. It may have mellowed out some. Uh, my my specific question is. Uh, it, it dawned on me this morning with their pheromonic, you know, sensitivities. If I could take some of my sister's clothing, some of my brother's clothing, because he's been with my brother now for almost a year, um, but my brother's never there. He's too busy with his job to be able to be there for him. So this little guy is, you know, it ain't a good situation for him. Um, and uh, maybe some of the, the clothing from various family members. And make pillows to go in the crate areas for them. Would that possibly ease transitional trying to adopt him? Into because you know we're all going to pass, and my, my dogs are just slightly older than he is. Basically, you're trying to introduce this dog that your sister had, and your brother's been taking care of it into your household with what. Three dogs or two dogs that you have? It's three. It will be a total of three, but they will actually be going between the house that was my grandparents and my sisters, the house that was my mother's and my brother's, okay. and my my place is also. So you know, I'm I'm going to have to I'm going to have to cart them. I'm going to have to leash them and cart them. We're all just going to have to learn to live with it. Sometimes it can be difficult uh, depending on the personality. What uh, this little dog that your sister had, is it a mixed breed or is it a chihuahua or what? What's the breed? Well, he's chihuahua also. As I say, um, okay. he's he's uh, half half okay. related to the oldest of my dog. Having chihuahuas myself, they can have some pretty snippy interaction between one of them usually wants to be dominant. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what would be the case here. But in most cases, they will, if you have some space, they will decide that, hey, I can have my space. We may not want to interact like uh, loving on each other, this sort of thing. And food is usually an issue. If you have food where they would have uh, competition eating, this sort of thing, so you probably need to feed them separately or at least watch while they're eating. But in most cases, they will uh, figure out, hey, we better, we've got a good thing here. We better adapt, and uh, I think your dogs will be. Except him, it's just going to take a little while. But I found that chihuahuas are a little hard sometimes to introduce uh, to others. And a lot of, most of the time, though, they will form a pack and actually would do quite well in, at, in your home. The clothing thing is not a bad idea. I'm not sure if it'll work. But you could try to uh, make the report back to us. Yeah, anything's worth a shot. To. I'll be glad to. Thank you so much. I appreciate everything y'all do. Uh, that's very <laughs> sweet, Mike. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, back on the topic of breeds and stuff, the Chihuahuas themselves. Um, we were they're they're always viewed as being a little more feisty than other breeds of dogs. Correct. You know, it depends on the dog, but yes, you're right. And uh, quite often, because they're small, I think they have some sort of a defensive uh, uh, mentality, and a lot of times they don't like to be approached uh, by somebody that they don't know. They're good watchdogs. They make a lot of noise if somebody comes to the door, (laughs) strangers in the house. Uh, But in general, I find this about nearly all breeds. People that have owned one or two generations of chihuahuas or boxers or whatever, they generally would stick with that breed if and when uh, a particular uh, dog would pass. Mm -hmm. So I'm convinced that a lot of it has to do with the owner and how they're handled. But, yes, in answer to your question, chihuahuas are pretty snippy. I had one, uh, (laughs) J.W., 
uh, he had he was a rescue chihuahua. He was a long-haired chihuahua. He's the one we have a picture here on the wall at the clinic, a uh, portrait, actually. And uh, I was trying to find him a home. He was abused um, at about a year, year and a half old, and I found somebody that actually wanted him, but he was not real good with kids. And with, they had several young children. And when friends came over, he would be uh, on the pants leg trying to, get the, the boys and this sort of thing. So he was not he was not real happy. So actually I, I took him back uh and kept him myself and he lived to be seventeen years old. So oh my goodness. He was a good life. Well that's good. And his name was J W which stood for just wonderful. Yeah, well, it's it's so sweet how with the right training and stuff, how how those dogs can they can kind of change like their personalities aren't set in stone they're not locked in like we uh just talking about chihuahuas this is a little bit different um we've got two chihuahuas that live next door to us and if they see us walking up to the the driveway or our driveway if they see us walking up to the door and they're outside they uh take it personally that we're even near them I can, they bark and yip at us, and I can only imagine they're saying just the worst things to us <laughs> when they're talking. Invade, invading their space. And, you know, other breeds have some uh, idiosyncrasies. One of the more popular breeds right now is a Shih Tzu. But given the opportunity, they will slip and bite. So these are all uh, different breeds, and a lot of it depends on how they're handled. Yeah, Absolutely. And uh, another one of, you know, those breeds that are looked at as, like, more aggressive and feisty or angry or, like, pit bulls and rottweilers. And like you said, like, each each dog, if they're pushed to a certain limit, they will snip and bite. It's just that pit bulls and rottweilers are just much more powerful than a little chihuahua is. Exactly. They're very popular, and uh, we see uh, a lot of pit bulls at the clinic. Uh they most of them are very well behaved, but then there are others that we know and the owner knows that uh, may not be able to be handled just for routine exam. So we have to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, it all depends, in my opinion, on how they're trained, how they're socialized. And by socialized, if you have a puppy, it is really advisable to get that puppy around as many people, uh, all ages as you can. In the developmental stage, I'm talking about probably 8 to 20 weeks old. It's very important that they are around other people and they uh, develop some degree of understanding that, hey, not everybody's going to be bad. I'm not going to be scared. And it's called socialization, and it works if you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like I've, I've had, I mean, everyone has their own experiences. Many people have had, you know, pit bull attacks or Rottweiler attacks or, you know, any, anything like that. But I've also seen like one of the sweetest dogs I ever met was an American pit bull and she was one of the most well-behaved, uh, and she was actually trained to herd, uh, sheep, I believe. So very versatile animals. Each, each different breed is not locked into their own personality. Exactly. When we come back, we will continue taking your pet questions. And the theme for today is just kind of taking your story. So send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. I'm Abram Nanny in for Kevin Farrell today here with Dr. Troy Major. It's pet day and we are looking for your pet questions today. So send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. We've got a, a pet question from uh, from Holly in Door County. What's going on, Holly? Hi, good morning. I just wanted to, um, This was, I thought this was so interesting. I, I found out that you could do it. We DNA'd a, uh, a dog that I found when I was out walking about a year ago. And um, I didn't think anything about this dog. He had some unusual things that he did, like... He wants to herd and chase like a deer. He'll stop when he smells it, and then you can't stop him unless he's on a leash. He's going after it. But anyway, they had a um, this show on Netflix, and it was about Australian Kelpies. And this dog looked just like an Australian Kelpie. So when Ancestry put out this DNA test for dogs, uh, we had him tested, and he was 80% 
uh, Australian cattle dog and 20% Australian shepherd, which explained a lot, but he is so smart. I was able to train him in like two months. I mean, it wow. was just unbelievable because I just have all cats. But somebody dumped him out. He was three years old is what the vet said when I found him. He was three, three, three years old. Uh, he was unneutered. He's, he's neutered now. Uh, but anyway, we have about 18 cats. And then this dog, and he gets along fine with all of them. He chased him at first, but he doesn't anymore. Anyway, I was going to say DNA testing your dog if you can, you know, afford to do it. It's like a luxury, I know. But it's so interesting because they connected us with all the other people who had DNA tested who had cattle dogs, cattle dog mixes. Um, and then we researched the history of it. But anyway, I wanted to pass that along. It, it, uh, it was just amazing. It was really interesting, and and he is truly, truly that breed. That he's just like the description of him. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for calling in. I mean, it's always really cool to see, um, you know, these unexpected uh, mixed breed dogs, and then you find out that they're eighty uh, percent one thing. That's that's always really cool to find. It wasn't real expensive, but uh, again, somebody else. Uh, abandoned a dog at our house that was gray, solid gray, with black polka dots on it. I had never seen anything like this before, and I, I didn't know what it was. We didn't DNA test it, but I, I started looking online, and the vet said it was a um, ratahoula, a catahoula mixed with a rat carrier. Oh, so interesting. Solid gray with black, black polka dots, and my sister took it. It is a snuggly dog. It is really a snuggly dog. But it was the most bizarre thing. I'm not a dog person, so uh, I was amazed to see that. Anyway, so anyway, there's my two bits. But DNA testing is, uh, you know, it was interesting. I figured he would be like a million different things, but he was those two, those two dogs. Right. Now, if you could stay right. on for just a second, uh, how do you how do you DNA test the dog? Do you have to get some saliva or you snip off some hair? How does that work? Yeah, yeah. You just uh, do the th same thing they do with people, I guess. You, it was a swab, and you put it in their mouth to make sure they hadn't had anything to eat or drink for 30 minutes or something. And uh, you, you do the swab around in their mouth, and you send it in. And they had run a special on it. It was like $20 less expensive than it had been before. And so I thought, what the heck? Let's find out, because he looked like an Australian Kelpie, but he was – Zero Australian Kelpie. He was Australian cattle dog and Australian shepherd. And if he was just Australian cattle dog, I think he just he would have been the brown and black mix, you know, the brown on the face and then mm -hmm. black. But because of the Australian shepherd on the front of front of his legs, he's got some white with little brown spots on it there. That's that's crazy. That's really cool. Well, thank you for calling in with that. I I, I wish yeah. that I had been done. I had done that previously with some of the dogs that I've had in the past. I know. <laughs> thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Holly. You have a good day. Yes, it's fairly economical. I I would say most of the DNA tests that you can uh, go online and look at are probably in the sixty to seventy five dollar range, which still is a cost, but. Uh, it's fairly accurate, and a lot of times on a mixed breed dog, you will get four or five different uh, possibilities. Usually, they will give you the dominant uh, uh, genetic uh, trait, which might be a lab or bulldog or something else. But then you might have four or five others that have contributed to genetically to that to that mixed breed, and it's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's similar. It's the same way for me as like uh, you know human ancestry, like finding out you know where you came from. I I'd probably care more about like the dogs, honestly, like n the mixed breed dogs, like finding out what all they're involved in because it could be so many things. Well, I don't think you're gonna have to worry about somebody reporting it to uh, some agency or something like that. I know yeah. <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the uh, human uh, genome type things did get in trouble. Uh, by sharing information that they shouldn't have. Yeah, that's not as that's not as big of a concern if someone out there knows what type of dog you have. Exactly. <laughs>
Yeah, I like I mentioned, like I wish back in the day I had uh some some DNA testing for this one dog because when he he was a he was a mutt for sure. Like we had no idea what he was, and when he wandered up, we uh he, when he first started wandering around our property uh back in back when I was in high school, um he looked like a bear we had no clue what he actually was uh and then when we finally came he finally came around us we were like oh that's that's a dog and we had no idea what he was i think uh we had an encyclopedia at the time of dogs and we tried to find it i think it was like a flat-haired terrier or something like that i am not sure uh but he was he was a mixture of so many different things now uh dr major i've, I've got a quick question for you myself if that's all right Okay. Um, so our dogs, we have we have two dogs. Um, the puppy, or she's she's still a puppy. She's a very big puppy. She's 95 pounds at less than a year old. Um, but she gets, she loves affection and stuff. Um, but she, if the other dog comes around her while we're petting her, she gets real feisty with the other dog. And I'm not sure how we can tell her that it's okay tell her that she's still going to be getting attention afterwards. Um, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how to keep her attitude from, from snapping out once in a while. You know, this is a problem and, uh, there are several reasons why dogs that are companion dogs, they have two dogs, especially two, the things that can set them off. One is food. Uh, sometimes they can be food aggressive between the two. So it's always advisable, if you can, to feed them separately. And the other is affection. In other words, if you're um, petting one dog, the other dog a lot of times wants to be petted as well, which makes it difficult if you're there by yourself. Uh, and I would try to figure out how to distract her, either with a toy or something like that, or a treat even, and tell her no. And you should be able to pet the other dog. So it gets to be more of a training thing and i'm sure some of the trainers that are listening could tell us some tips but really it can be a problem and we have seen some pretty fierce fights uh some of it over dominance but also jealousy and uh, they are capable of that yeah absolutely even though you know they've been best friends for i want to say eight eight or nine months now um but yeah they can still they can still snap at each other I uh, I have a similar issue with one of my cats. Uh, she gets very jealous uh, to the point where if I'm like on FaceTime with another human, she has to be like in between me and the phone. <laughs> um, but she really doesn't like if I give the other cats attention. If I call call their name, she's coming right behind them. That sort of thing. Now, Doctor Major, that is Marissa who is running our uh, our board for us today with uh, with the scramble that we had running around. Is is the advice similar? Uh, that you would give as far as cats go? Uh, is the advice similar as to dogs? I don't think you're going to get into a situation where the cats are fighting, but quite often when you're petting one cat, another cat will come up and nudge you like, hey, I want my time. You know what I'm <laughs> exactly. If you're, on a, if you're on a computer, on a keyboard, uh, a lot of times they will step on it, uh, simply, I think, trying to get your attention. But yes, they will uh, can interfere with the conversation just by. Uh, and cats like to headbutt, if you will, and they spread their pheromones uh, by rubbing on you and on other objects. And certainly, that can uh, be distracting if you're trying to have a serious conversation. Right. Yeah, and, uh, I I don't have any cats myself, but when I go to my brother's, he's got two cats. Um, and and they definitely they definitely have big personalities, but they if one of them's getting attention, the other one is right there beside him. Yeah, I, I probably I I enjoy cats myself. I'm very allergic to them, oh, no. <laughs> but they're they're very sweet animals. I do enjoy them. Today is an all pet day, and Doctor Major is here taking your pet questions. I believe Chico in Oxford has a pet question for us. Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. I'm Abram Naney here with Doctor Troy Major. Now we've got a little bit of time left. I don't, and we've got a, a full bank of calls. So if you have any questions or comments, email animals at mpbonline. Dot or now, as promised, Chico in Oxford has a question for us or comment. What's going on, Chico? 
Yeah, I've, I've got a pet comment. My, my, my comment is about what people name their dogs. And um, I've always thought it was interesting what people name their dogs. And I always, if I see someone with a dog, I always ask what the dog's name is, not just out of courtesy, but out of interest, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, back in the 1980s, back before the Internet screwed up everything, to get tickets to a concert, you wanted to get the good seats, you had to line up the morning they went on sale outside a venue, right? Right. So on June 29th, 1985, Jimmy Buffett was playing a show at Mud Island in Memphis. And tickets went on sale a few months earlier, and I was working in Tupelo at a record store called Album Alley. Well, the morning the tickets went on sale for Jimmy Buffett, there was a long line waiting for us to open up. And I walked out there, and the first lady in line had a dog on a leash. So I asked her, I said, what's the dog's name? And she said, Gula. I said, Gula? How did you come up with the name Gula for your dog, lady? Right. And she said, because Jimmy Buffett was born in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Oh, wow. I said, oh, that's right, that's right. And she was wearing a University of Southern Mississippi T-shirt, and she tugged on her shirt, and she said, and he graduated from Southern. <laughs> and I said, that's right, lady. And she got really good tickets that day. I saw to it. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, uh, we're always always proud of the talent that comes out of Mississippi. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Chico. We appreciate that comment. Uh, now, Dr. Major, I believe we've got a, d- another pet question for you from Jake in Louisiana. Jake, what's going on? I'm um, just driving back and forth to work. I uh, listen to your program, enjoying it. I appreciate uh, that. What's your question? I have a question for the doctor. We uh, raised uh, winter dogs for years, and uh, we always allow them to have one set of puppies before we have them fixed. And it generally changes their personality. They tend to plump up. And I'm, I've got a little young dog right now that I would really not like that to happen to. We just love the way she is. Is there anything we can do for that not happening to her when we have her fixed? You know, I understand the dilemma there. And uh, a lot of dogs do, uh, as you say, plump up. Uh, and you said wiener dog. I guess we're talking about dachshunds, right? Yeah, and uh, yes. <laughs> that's about the other name of them, I think. And I don't know if it's official. But anyway, uh, one, you can control the food intake. Uh, there are people that would rather not spay their dog, but also that some of the hunters do not like to have their dog uh, spayed or neutered. But here's the thing with the uh, uh, not spaying. A lot of times they will continue to come in, come in season pretty regular every six months or so. And a lot of the dogs we've seen, I'd say five to ten cases of pyometra, which revolves around uh, a uterus that uh, develops uh, purulent material over time, given the continued heat cycle. So keep in mind that that could be a problem later on. But we see dogs that are intact or not in space, they're overweight as well. So I guess my suggestion is uh, consult with your vets. You sound like you've raised dachshunds for quite a while, and it is a problem. You can uh, certainly control the food intake uh, and be sure that there's not another problem contributing to that weight gain. But you're so right. Yes, sometimes they do gain weight because you remove the ovaries and it removes the estrogen influence that affects the body. All right, Jake, we appreciate that call. Now, Dr. Major, is uh, is it typically just the a hormonal thing that causes that, or is that, is that personality? I think it's part of it. The hormonal primarily, though, uh, would cause them, uh, just a change in their body physiology because of the fact that they've been spayed, and certainly they can gain weight. The flip side of that is the development of infection and cancer possibly later on in life, uh, and that, that can be certainly weighed against weight gain. Right. Well, going back to the phones, we have Amy and Clinton. I believe Amy has a question about a shizu. Amy, what's going on? Uh, well, I have two. 
and they both seem to uh, lick their paws an awful lot, and I know that that could be a, an issue. Uh, what can be? What do I need to do about it? Are they developing sores on their paws, or are they just licking? Uh, they're I mean, they're just licking. They right, and usually that changes the color. Saliva will cause it if they're a white dog. Cause it to be brown. I would suggest maybe checking for a food that has uh, a fairly high level of fish oil or that you can actually supplement fish oil. That seems to help a lot, a lot of the dogs. I, uh, I'm sure you've probably talked to your dad about it. But, and certainly allergies, but a lot of dogs that lick their feet do it year-round, and some of it has to do with habits. They are much like a cat. You see a cat grooming itself, licking its paws. And a lot of dogs will do that. I think it does become a habit. And it seems to be more apparent if you're trying to sleep at night and they start licking their feet. I don't know if that's the case for your dogs. But uh, it does It does happen like that. Try the fish oil and see. I'm talking about in their diet, not on their feet, but in their diet. Uh, certainly antihistamines may work as well. Your typical vin- okay. Benadryl may, may help them some. All right. Good, luck well, with good, that. good to know. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for calling, Amy. Yeah, I I definitely have a similar problem with my my Great Dane. She uh, dries her paws out really bad because of how much she licks them. Last call, Fletch and Yazoo. We've got a very short time left. What's you got going on? Hey. Well, first off, I was going to ask you if y'all got a video I sent, but secondly, I'm looking at these two uh, uh, bald eagles. Uh, north of Yazoo City, I've never seen them fly so close to 49 before. But uh, oh wow, uh, that's yeah. always really cool. My my dad sends me pictures of bald eagles that fly around our house all the time. That's really cool. Just majestic at how big they are. But I've sent a video in earlier this week of a, of a snapping turtle that I picked up and helped across the road. Uh, I don't know if y'all got it. Uh, remind me that correct email. It's animals at mpbonline.org, and we probably did get it. Um, it's it's my fault. I need to get those. I, I was going to do it today. I need to get those routed to my inbox. So that's my fault that we haven't viewed it yet. I apologize for that. But we'll get back to you on that for sure. Yeah, take a look so you can see that snap internal uh, earning its nickname. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I imagine it does. Yeah. They, they're not always the friendliest of animals, are they? I'm sure you're aware. Just always be careful because they can extend that neck out quite a distance and uh, can deliver a pretty severe bite. So you always try to be careful with those. Yeah, very, very impactful with that beak that they've got. Well, appreciate that call, Fletch. I'll I'll check out that email in just a bit. I'm sorry about that. Um, so that is going to wrap us up. I had, had a good time today. That was, uh, thank you guys and the Creature Comforts audience for making me feel welcome. That was really cool. Thank you, Dr. Major, for this, for today. Uh, Creature Comforts is a product, production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio. To hear today's show or previous shows, visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Media app. Or, of course, find it on your favorite podcasting app. Today's show was produced by myself and engineered by the wonderful Marissa Vaughn. Our call screener was Charles Arnold. And for Dr. Major, I'm Abram Nanny. Up next is AutoCorrect with Coach Charlie Melton. And tune in next Thursday at 9 for Creature Comforts, only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.